So a vector, uh, so this right here is a ray. The way we represent a vector is we draw a, a starting point, a line, and then I, the way I do it, and there's different ways of doing it, I just use a half arrow. And that's fairly common in a lot of textbooks that do that. So see the difference between that and an array. Array has a, a full arrow, so it means it's going on forever. This is saying, I need to know what direction I'm going in, but it actually stops there. It doesn't keep going forever. Okay? So it has a starting point and an ending point. This is the initial point, and that is the terminal point. So you could describe a vector by telling someone the initial point and the terminal point. That would describe the vector to them, right? This is where it starts, this is where it ends. Okay? Then we also have the standard position. The standard position of vector, and the cool thing about vectors is you can pick them up and move them around, all around. As long as you keep them going in the same direction and the same length, you could pick this up and sit it down. In other words, I could apply the force at, at a chair. I could walk over somewhere else and apply it to a different chair, right? But it's the same force. I'm pushing in the same direction, have the same strength, right? So this little vector that's sitting here in the middle of space, I could pick it up and move it somewhere else as long as I keep the same distance in the same direction. Okay, and standard position means that the um, initial point is at the point zero zero, or the origin. So if I have an x y plane, a, a, a vector in standard position is has the initial point at zero zero, or the origin. Okay. So for naming points or naming vectors, okay, this is a, say this is point P and point Q. The way we'd name this vector is we'd say vector PQ and we put a little, the proper hat on it. Notice that the hat looks just like the vector itself. It's a little um, line with a half arrow on one end. Okay, and notice that the, it matters which side the arrow is on. Do you notice that? Which letter is the arrow above or the half arrow? Q. Q, which is the terminal point, right? So even the way we name it indicates which direction it's pointing, right? It's going from P to Q. If you wrote this QP with the same hat, it wouldn't be, it'd be a different vector, right? Same magnitude, but a different vector. Yes? Uh, no, I mean, of course, on the, on the naming it, we always wanted to be away from the letters, but when you're drawing in a 3D plane, I mean a 2D plane, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's just a one-sided thing, yeah. Okay, so now component form. Another way to write a vector is we write it like this with um, my X component and my Y component. So what does component mean? Well, any vector, because it's um, slanted, can be broken into a horizontal component or a component in the x direction and a vertical component or a component in the y direction. So um, notice this looks kind of like a point, but those are, those are not badly drawn parentheses. Those are meant to be drawn like that where they're pointy. That's what indicates this is a vector, not a point, right? So for example, if you saw 3 comma 5, that would just mean a point on the plane at, at over 3 at 5, right? If you saw this, that would be a vector with a horizontal component of 3 and a vertical component of 5. Or another way to think of it is this is a vector in standard position with terminal point at 3 comma 5, okay? Of course, the terminal point isn't always 3, 5. It's only when it's in standard position. If I move it somewhere else, then it will be over 3, up 5 from whatever the initial point was. Okay? So let's look at that point for a minute. 3, 5. The vector 3, 5. So that would be over 1, 2, 3, up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we'd have a vector that looks like that, right? So there's the vector, um, we'll call it vector V, just so we have a name. We can also name vectors like this with just one letter, and so they're not referring to any points, it's just a letter that refers to that vector. So this is vector V, 3 comma 5, it's the standard position, has the initial point at 0, 0 and the terminal point at 3, 5. Um, 
So now we can talk about the magnitude and direction of this thing. <clears throat> the magnitude is just the length, and the direction is the angle from positive x-axis. So you see in this case, the direction would be determined by this angle right here. We can call it theta. Now hopefully at this point you're beginning to see some trigonometric application here. So if I know the components and I know my trigonometry, I could come up with the magnitude and direction of this vector, couldn't I? Without me teaching you anything else? Um, if you're not seeing it right away, I could help you by kind of drawing in the vertical, uh, let me use a different color. There's the, there's the vertical component. And here's the horizontal component. And what are those? Horizontal, horizontal component was three. The vertical component was five. And so you could figure out the magnitude, couldn't you? Um, and just to, uh, again, for notation's sake, the way we write magnitude is we'd say it looks like a absolute value on steroids or a double absolute value. That's how we say magnitude in terms of vectors. We put the, uh, we put the vector inside a double absolute value, and uh, that means magnitude. So the magnitude of this vector would be the square root of 25 minus 9. I'm sorry, plus 9. Everyone see where the 25 and the 9 are coming from? So this would be the square root of 34. 25 is 5 squared and 9 is 3 squared. So I'm just using the Pythagorean theorem there. Okay? So the magnitude would be the square root of 34. And we could also find the direction, couldn't we? How would we find theta? Any ideas? Since you all are trigonometry experts. We find the inverse of... We could use Sokotoa because of the uh, right angle, or a lot of you that like law of signs, you could just do law of signs because you have nine degrees, right? Um, and we have that other side now. I like Sokotoa, so I'd probably just go tangent theta is equal to five over three. So then I take inverse tangent of five thirds which is second, 10, 5 divided by 3. That would be theta is equal to 59 degrees. So the magnitude of vector v is the square root of 34, whatever that is. And the direction of vector v is 59 degrees, positive 59 degrees from the positive x-axis. That's what the 59 degrees means, right? And of course we could go the other way too, couldn't we? If I said um, the absolute or the the magnitude of say vector w is 10 and the direction of vector w is 150 degrees, then you could calculate the components of that vector, couldn't you? If we drew a quick little picture, this is 10, and that is 150, right? And isn't it true? That, that right there is my y component, and that right there is my x component. Mm -hmm. And so we know that the x component is equal to, well, isn't it um, cosine of 150 times 10?
Did I jump too far for you there? <clears throat> Let me say this again. Well, there's a couple ways to look at it. We could just look at the triangle and think from that receptor that this is 30 degrees, yes? Right? So you could say um, <clears throat> that uh, cosine of 30 degrees is equal to... Um, adjacent, which is component x component, divided by 10, right? Um, but then we have to remember that it's negative, right? Yeah. So what I'm suggesting is if we just use cosine of 30, or cosine of 150, right, that'll put the negative in for me, right? So then you put a little 10 there, and it'll be exactly that. So that means that the y component would be equal to what? Yep, 10 times the... Uh, 10 times the sine of 150, okay? Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah, you can spin clockwise or counterclockwise, yeah. So once again, like usually happens in trigonometry when I'm trying to find an angle, there's usually an infinite number of possibilities, right? So if, if the direction is 150, it could have also been negative 210, right? Or it could have also been 360 plus 150, which would be 4, 5, 10, right? I mean, there's, there's an infinite number of possible angles that could represent that direction because we can just keep spinning around and land and spin around three more times and land. So usually what we do is just take the closest angle to zero, you know. Um, sometimes we try to say positive, so we, even if it, if it was negative 30, we might call it 330. You know, there's not a, there's not a hard and fast rule for what angle you use. But I prefer that you not get ridiculous and, you know, go around the circle 30 times and then use that one. Because then I have to go around the thir circle 30 times to figure out whether you did it right or not. Which is not that hard. I give you that. But. Okay? So that's a skill that you should have with vectors. Given the component form and the magnitude, you should be able to... I'm sorry. Given the component form, you should be able to come up with the magnitude and direction. Or given the direction and the magnitude, you should be able to come up with a component form. Yeah? Yeah. That makes sense? We're okay with that? Okay. Cool. You also can add vectors. Oh, really? So, for example, if like that one we are talking about, that if Robert and I were having a tug-of-war, we're really applying two different forces to the same thing, aren't we? So, and this is the same thing I was talking about with the tractors. So, if you um, wanted to calculate who is going to win that tug of war, you could just, if you could figure out their, our vectors, you could just add our two vectors together and see what the resultant force is. So, if, the, if, we're, if I'm pulling like this and Robert's pulling that way, if we add the two vectors together, if the vector ends up going that way, that means he won. If the vector ends up going my direction, that means I won. Okay? And you can even do it where, let's say that we have two tractors against one, or maybe I'm not strong enough to say, Robbie, come help me. So now we split the rope, I unraveled it, and he took a little bit this way, and I took a little So now we're, I'm pulling like this, and he's pulling like that, and Robert's pulling like that. So we still have, now we have three vectors applying on the same section, right? So it would look like there's a rope, there's a vector going that way, there's a vector going that way, and there's a vector going that way, right? So we could take those three vectors, add them together, and it would give us, once again, the resultant force. Okay? Right, exactly. So mine and Robbie's forces are kind of wasted because we're part of our effort is going in the wrong direction. You know, it, it would, would have been much smarter if I wouldn't have rattled the rope and I would have just had Robbie get in behind me, you know, and he pulls, so we're both pulling in the same way. That would have been smarter because then we'd have two vectors going in the same direction, right? But the way I did it, I did that on purpose to show you that now we have a vector going, you know, with a little angle there, a little angle there, and this one's 180 degrees, so these are not pulling directly opposite of Robert. All of Robert's force is going into the direction that he wants, and our efforts are going kind of in the direction one, but also in other directions, right? So really, all that's applying against Robert is the horizontal component of our force. Does that make sense? Okay, so anyway. 
But the point is we should be able to add some vectors. So if I have a vector that's going like this, I have another vector that's going like this, okay? And I want to add those two vectors together. Well, I can think of it in terms of magnitude and direction, because remember, I can just pick a vector up and move it, right? As long as I keep the same direction and the same magnitude. So if I wanted to, to figure out what the resultant force was, I could take the initial point of one of the vectors and put it at the terminal point of the other vector, which would look like this. Okay, so what I did is I took that vector and put it over there. Notice I kept the same direction and the same magnitude. I didn't change the direction or magnitude. Notice if you were, if you were to put the origin right here at the, where the two vectors touch, it would be the same angle spinning to that vector. Does that make sense? Okay, so where's the resultant force? Here's the cool thing. The resultant force is right here, I'll use a different color so you can see it. The resultant force is right there. So you start at the initial point of the first vector and go to the terminal point of the second vector, and that would represent the um, uh, resultant force. Yeah. Yeah. So we're adding these two vectors together to see what if both of these vectors are applied to the same thing, what would the resultant vector be? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, and, and redraw, the, yep, redraw the other vector. Yep, exactly. Yes? So why do you move that there? Can you, like, answer the resultant division could also form a triangle. Right, right, and that wouldn't, that wouldn't work. So what you really need to do is, what you're really doing is drawing a um, parallelogram and you're drawing the diagonal as the resultant force. That's what you're really doing. That, that'd be, I mean, that's another way to look at it. I, I, I like putting, picking the one up and putting it over there because then it really looks like we're adding them. See, so yeah, the one force we took me here, then the other force took me there. So it's kind of like saying both forces are being applied at the same time, but I'm stopping time and I'm breaking them apart. Like I'll let the first force go its full force. Then I'll start from there and let the second force go its full force and see if where, where I end up. That's kind of what's happening. If that makes sense. Yeah. We could have picked the one on the right up and put it on the end of the, yeah, because uh, you're right. That would be this guy right here, wouldn't it? Yeah, both of them would lead us to the same point. Okay. Yeah. So the result is You're right. So again, what that would look like if, let's say that I, there's a desk here. I, we've been moving a lot of stuff, so I'm thinking about all the things we've been moving. And let's say that um, I'm trying to push, <coughs> <coughs> I'm trying to push the desk over here with this force, and my brother-in-law is trying to push the desk over here with that force. Notice mine's a lot longer than his. Which is actually not true. He's a lot stronger than I am. But, um, uh, so the question is, where would the desk actually move? Would it move in my direction or his direction? His, Neither, right? It would move somewhere in between, right? So it's actually not going to go in either one of our directions. Neither one of us is going to be happy. It's going to end up being somewhere kind of over here, isn't it? So it'll kind of go probably a little bit closer to mine because my force is bigger, but, but it's not going to go in either direction. It's going to go somewhere in between the two. Okay? The only time you'd go in the right direction is if we we're both going in the same direction, right? So if I'm pushing this way, he's pushing this way, then the, the desk would move that way, right? Less come to find out my son was over on the other end trying to mess with this and push in a different direction, right? But, okay, so, but there's an easy way to look at, um, I, want to I want to see if you can see it graphically here. So notice that the component of this guy is right there, right? So there's components of that guy, and here's, if you will, components of the other guy. Okay, notice that if you just took this component, which is 3, and that component, which is negative 1, right, and added them together, you would get 
2, which is the component of the new vector. You see that? And likewise, the vertical component of this one is 1, the vertical component of this one is 2, and you can see if you add them together, you'll get a vertical component of 3, which is the vertical component of the new vector. So the cool thing about vectors is if they're in component form, all I have to do is add their components when I'm adding them. So if I knew that this first vector was 3 comma 1, and the other vector was negative 1 comma 2, if I want to add them, so let's call this vector u and vector v, so then u plus v would be 3 plus a negative 1 for my first component, and um, 1 plus 2 for my second component, which of course would be 2 comma 3. Notice that's the same as all. So you could do it by drawing, sketching it out, and kind of look at, looking at it graphically, but usually it's easier, especially if it's already in component form. We could just add the components. If it's not component form, because we're good at trigonometry, we could put it in component form and add it that way. So you have a choice. If it's not in component form, you could try to graph it out and look at it and see what it, the resultant force is. If it is in component form, then it's really much easier just to add the components and get a resultant force. Okay? Isn't that fun? Yeah. What about multiplying factors? <laughs> what about multiplying vectors? Yes? No. It gets real complicated when we try to multiply vectors. Yes? Question mark. That's exactly it. No, no. Three and one are the x and y component of u, and negative one and two are the y, x and y of that. Yeah, yeah. Those are my two vectors there. So when you're multiplying vectors, there are actually three different multiplications in vectors. We only have one multiplication of numbers, but in vectors, there are three different multiplications. The first, yeah, question? Okay, the first multiplication is just multiplying a vector by a scalar. And a scalar just means a regular number. Right? So in other words, if let's say that I'm um, pushing a desk, I take my vitamins real quick, and suddenly my magnitude has grown greatly. So I'm still pushing in the same direction I was before, but my magnitude is five times as big. Right? That, that's a scalar multiplication. So that just means if it's in component form, if I, if I know you, <laughs> if I know you, <laughs> uh, very good. is three comma one, then I know that 5u is 15 comma 5. So not only does it make the magnitude five times as big, but it also makes each component five times as big. And the cool thing about scalar multiplication is it does not change the direction. Right? Multiplying by a scalar does not change the direction of the force. It just affects the magnitude and of course the components, because if the magnitude grows, the components have to grow. But notice they keep that same ratio. Okay? Dylan, do you have a question? Yeah. yeah, this is called scalar multiplication. And it looks just like that. We just put a 5 outside the vector. Actually, I'm being a little bit sloppy here. When I do vectors, I should put the little hat on so you know the vectors. Otherwise, there's no way to know these are vectors. Well, you'd know them because of the way I do those little things. But it's good to get in the habit of putting little hats on your vectors. And, and why should so you know it's a vector, just like you know a policeman oh, right. is a policeman because they have a police hat on, right? Oh, right. You know a fireman's a fireman because they have a fire. I, hat I know on. that. You know they're a vector because they have a vector. You know a cowboy is a cowboy because they have a cowboy hat on. I, I know that. Okay. You know a teacher is a teacher because a teacher has a teacher. Okay. Graduation oh. cap on? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right, that's, yeah, I, I, I take an objection to you calling them that, but yes, that's what they are. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, the, it's the parenthesis version of vectors, yeah, to distinguish between a vector and just a point, right? If I have a rounded off normal thing, that'd be a point. This is a vector. Again, from zero, zero to that point, right? Okay, now, the other multiplications is called the dot product. and the cross product.
And I'm only going to teach you one of them, sorry. You have to take um, Calc 3 to get the other one. Cross product. Okay, so these are both vector mul multiplications. So you're multiplying a vector by a vector. And the interesting thing is that one of them produces another vector. The other one produces a number. Okay? So dot product produces a number. Cross product produces a vector. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit of a cross product just to whet your interest, but we're not, I'm not going to actually make you do it. Because this is actually a fairly complicated process. And if you're interested, you can look up on YouTube and type in cross product and you'll find all kinds of things. Okay. But I will not be testing you on it. So the cross product, when you multiply a vector by a vector using cross product, what it does is it produces another vector that's orthogonal to the two vectors. So now we're talking three space here. This is why I'm not going into it because this class is not supposed to be dealing with three space, right? So if you have two vectors sitting in a normal plane like this, let's say my, these are my two vectors. If I do the cross product of this guy and that guy, it produces another vector that's coming up out of the plane like that. I do not like it. Isn't that cool? I think they actually tried to teach me. And so these things are very useful when I start talking about 3D space and I'm trying to come up with a perpendicular plane to the plane that I'm in or something like that. All I have to do is create, do a cross product of two vectors and get another vector that's perpendicular to them, then I can build a plane around this new vector. Because all you need to find the equation of a plane is a vector in them. So, so there's, there, and there's a lot of, of course, other uses for that. So that's what it produces. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about cross product. If you're interested in it, you can go research it and spend more time playing around with it. Yeah? So orthogonal. Orthogonal is the 3D version of perpendicular. Okay. Yeah. We use orthogonal because what happens is, you know, usually when I say perpendicular, it means like this, right? But if I say these two lines are orthogonal, that means it could be like this or 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 like this. Because like we have 3Ds now, right? You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of orthogonal lines. In 2D space, there's only one perpendicular line. Right? That's, that's actually a really important theorem in two-dimensional geometry, right? Yeah. So if you have a line and, a, and another point off the line, there's only one perpendicular line for you know, that kind of thing. So, okay? All right. Um, so dot product. What is the dot product? The dot product looks like this. You take, you multiply the components with each other. So in other words, if I had, um, let's say that u is 3 comma 5, and w, these are new vectors now, are negative 2 comma 8. So the dot product of u and w, and the symbol we use for dot product is an extra fat multiplication dot. It's not just a normal multiplication dot, because that would just seem multiplication, but we make it extra fat. Okay? It's a big, big multiplication dot. That means dot product, as opposed to cross product. I, sa I said I wouldn't say any more about it, but here I am again. Cross product looks like that. We use an old, an old X like we did in grade school, right? Okay, so dot product, what it is, is it produces a number, and what the number is is just the X component times the x component plus the y component times the y component. That's all it is. And that would give me negative 6 plus 40. 32. 34. Isn't that cute? What's that? It is a lot simpler than cross product. The cross product actually involves matrices and finding the determinant of a matrix, several determinants. And I thought we were going to talk about the yeah, final matrix. No, we're not going to yeah, touch they, matrices. I think they tried to teach me about the matrices when I took this last year, but I was by myself. So yeah. Okay, so why do we care about the dot product? Well, it has a lot of, there's a lot of useful pieces to it. Um, it's, uh, there's a couple of formulas that involve the dot product. Um, one really cool way is that you can use the dot product to quickly, quickly check the angle between two vectors. So let's see if I can remember this right. If the dot product is zero, 
then the angle between the two vectors is 90 degrees. So they're perpendicular to each other. So if you're trying to figure out whether two lines are perpendicular, if you can have some vectors that represent those lines and take their dot product, if it's zero, that means they're perpendicular. If it's anything other than zero, that means they're not perpendicular. So that's kind of a quick, easy check, because this is pretty easy to do, right? Uh, likewise, if it's negative, if the dot product is negative, that means the angle between them is obtuse, bigger than 90 degrees. And if the dot product is positive, that means the angle between them is acute, otherwise known as smaller than 90 degrees, right? So a positive dot product means acute angle. A zero dot product means that a, um, a right angle. And a negative dot product means an obtuse angle. And we're talking about the angle between the two vectors, right? So if I was to look at uh, V, let's draw them up real quick, make sure what I just said is correct. So if we were to draw 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so that would be my vector u, right? And vector w would be negative 2, comma 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And you can see, sure enough, the angle between them is um, acute angle, isn't it? Okay. What was that? What was that third dot product you were talking about? Wait, um, if it, if the dot product is negative, it's obtuse. If the dot product is zero, it's right. And if the uh, dot product is positive, it's acute. Oh, uh, it's a cute little angle. Yes, Mike. So in that example, they're they're forty they're forty four <laughs> they're forty four. Yeah. Uh, it's just the fact that it's positive is telling you that that angle is acute. The 34 has nothing to do with the angle other than it's positive and sine. There's nothing, um, as far as I know, there's nothing in that picture that really relates to 34. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a number that means something in terms of these two vectors that we use in order to fix 34, but it really has nothing to do with the picture that I'm explaining. I might be wrong because I haven't spent a lot of time on vectors. In fact, Vector analysis was my no. Vector analysis was my least favorite class in undergrad. 